Today, we're going to talk about why Bitcoin and discuss some history of money. First, disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor here on this channel. We just talk and explore and learn together. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. All right, so Bitcoin. A lot of people get infatuated with the price, which is okay, which is great. And this is priced in U.S. dollars. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about U.S. dollars and why Bitcoin. One of the first reasons why Bitcoin is because Bitcoin has a max supply of 21 million. Why is that important? Because you just can't print more Bitcoin like you can do the U.S. dollar. Printing excessive amounts of money causes inflation. And we'll talk about that as well. All right, so first I wanted to start off with this quote from Thomas Jefferson. And this is this is an amazing quote. Thomas Jefferson here. All right, let's get into it. If the American people ever allow banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their forefathers conquered. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing army. The, the issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people whom it properly belongs. Now, this is Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding forefathers of this nation. And that is a profound statement. So I would like folks to read that statement on their own time, become familiarized with it. But he's pretty much telling us that the banks should not be in control of the currency. So is that what we have now? Well, I'm not sure. So we're going to do some research and explore why Bitcoin. All right. So moving right along. Executive Order 6102. Executive Order 6102 is an executive order signed on April 5th, 1933 by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt for forbidding the hoarding of gold coins gold bullion and gold certificates within the continental United States. The executive order was made under the authority of the Trading with the Enemy Act 1917 and is amended by the Emergency Banking Act in March 33. So essentially in 1933 it became illegal to hoard gold. Why? Well from my understanding because our dollar was being backed by gold so we wanted to have all that gold in the reserve for our money can be backed by a tangible good, which, which they call a fixed exchange rate system. So we're going to explore that. A fixed exchange rate system, sometimes called a peg exchange rate, is, is a type of exchange rate regime in which a currency's value is fixed or pegged by a monetary authority against the value of another currency, a basket of other currencies, or another measure of value, such as gold. There are, there are benefits and risks to using a fixed exchange rate system. A fixed exchange rate is typically used to stabilize the exchange rate of a currency by directly fixing its value in a predetermined ratio to a different, more stable or more international prevalent currency to which the currency is pegged. In doing so, the exchange rate between the currency and its peg does not change because of market conditions. Unlike a floating exchange regime, this makes trade and investment between currency areas easier and more predictable as especially useful for small economies that borrow primarily in foreign exchange and in which external trade forms a large part of their GDP. A, a fixed exchange rate system can also be used to control the behavior of a currency such as by limiting rates of inflation. However, in doing so, the paid currency is then controlled by its reference value. As such, when the reference value rises or falls, it then follows that the value of a currency's peg to it will also rise and fall in relation to other currencies and commodities with which the peg currency can be traded. In other words, a peg currency is dependent upon its reference value to dictate how its current worth is defined at any given time. In addition, according to the Mundale Fleming model, with perfect capital mobility, a fixed exchange rate prevents a government from using domestic monetary policy to achieve microeconomic stability. All right, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but essentially you see that the fixed exchange rate is called a peg exchange rate, and usually you have your currency pegged to something such as gold. All right, so how do we come about that uh, fixed exchange rate? 
where we talked about Thomas Jefferson and what he thought and how he feel the bank shouldn't control. In his words, if, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their forefathers conquered. And when you think about that, and you, and you look at where we're at today, where you have the government trying to take down Google because corporations are becoming too strong, it's essentially is what Thomas Jefferson warned us about. And which is why the executive order was put in place, which is why we were on a fixed currency. Then we come to Bretton Woods, which kind of describes how we got to the currency rates that we are now. So the Bretton Woods system, the Bretton Woods system of monetary management established the rules for commercial and financial relations among the United States, Canada, Western European countries, Australia, and Japan. After the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement, the Bretton Woods system was the first example of a fully negotiated monetary order intended to govern monetary relations among independent states. The, the chief features of the Bretton Woods system were an obligation for each country to adopt a monetary policy that maintained its external exchange rates with 1%, tying its currency to gold and, and the ability of the International Monetary Fund to bridge temporary imbalances of payment. Also, there was a need to address the lack of cooperation among the countries and to prevent competitive devaluation of, of the currencies as well. P preparing to rebuild the international economic system while World War II was still raging, 730 delegates from all 44 Latin nations gathered at the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, United States for the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, also known as the Bretton Woods Conference. The delegates deliberated during the 1st through the 22nd of July, 1944, and signed the Bretton Woods Agreements on its final day, setting up system of rules, institutions, and procedures to regulate the international monetary system. These accords established the IMF and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development which today is part of the World Bank. The United States was controlled two-thirds of the world's gold, insisting that the Bretton Woods system rests on both gold and the U.S. dollar. Soviet representatives attended the conference but later declined to ratify the final agreements, charging that the institutions they have created were branches of Wall Street. These organizations became operational in 1945 after a sufficient number of countries had ratified the agreement. Bretton Woods system, as, as it describes here, and of course, we all got to do our own research. This is just a brief outline on why I chose Bitcoin and why I believe Bitcoin was created and why I believe Bitcoin will be king is because we go back down the line and what Thomas Jefferson said. Then we go to the executive order that was placed to keep our money, for the most part, a fixed exchange rate. And then we talk about the fixed exchange rate. And then we talk about the Bretton Woods system was pretty much, yeah, yeah, 44 Latin nations to come together and agree on this monetary system. All right, so everything pretty much seemed to be going okay. But then we have this here, the Nixon shock. If you know Richard Nixon, he was the president of the United States. All right, so the Nixon shock. The Nixon shock was a series of economic measures undertaken by the United States President Richard Nixon in 1971 in response to increasing inflation, the, the most significant of which were wage and price freezes, surcharges on imports, and a unilateral consolation of the direct international convertibility of the United States dollar to gold. While Nixon actions did not formally abolish the existing Bretton Woods system, of international financial exchange. The, the suspension of one of its key components effectively rendered the Bretton Woods system inoperative. While Nixon publicly stated in his intention to resume direct convertibility of the dollar after reforms to the Bretton Woods system have been implemented, all attempts at reform proved unsuccessful. By 1973, the Bretton Woods system was replaced de facto by the current regime based on freely floating fiat. So, the Nixon shock abolished the Bretton Woods system. And 
like I said, I'm not a financial advisor, but I wanted to understand money and the history of money and study money to get to my question, why Bitcoin? And it seems to me the Nixon shock was the start of what Thomas Jefferson feared. So once the Nixon shock came, then what we have next, a floating exchange rate. So we're going to explore this. Once again, I can't say it enough. You want to do your own research. This is just to put the spark up in your eye, to put the spark in your brain and to give you some idea as to why Bitcoin, because I get this question a lot. Why Bitcoin? And of course, they don't teach us about money in school. So we got, we got to teach ourselves. But thankfully for us, we have the Internet. All right. So floating exchange rate in microeconomics and economic policy, a floating exchange rate. Also known as a fluctuating or flexible exchange rate is a type of exchange rate regime in which a currency value is allowed to fluctuate in response to foreign exchange market events. A currency that uses a floating exchange rate is also known as a floating currency. In contrast to a fixed currency, the value of which is instead specified in terms of material goods, another currency, or a set of currencies. The, the idea of the last band to reduce currency fluctuations. In the modern world, most of the world's currencies are floating and include the most widely traded currencies, the United States dollar, the Euro, the Swiss franc, the Indian rupee, the pound sterling, the Japanese yen, and the Australian. However, even with floating currencies, central banks often participate in markets to attempt to influence the value of floating currency exchange rates. Let me stop right there. Central banks often participate in markets to attempt to influence the value of a floating exchange rate. Now, going back to what Thomas Jefferson said, you know, this guy, he was around America since, since they started this thing, and he said it. So now we have a floating exchange rate where the banks are attempting to influence the value. All right. The Canadian dollar most closely resembles a pure floating currency because the Canadian National Bank has not interfered with its price since, since it's officially stopped doing so during 1988. The U.S. dollar a close second with very little change of its foreign reserves. By contrast, Japan and the U.K. intervened to a greater extent and India medium range intervention by its National Bank, the Reserve Bank of India. This is just explain floating exchange rate. and what we do know is opposite from the fixed exchange rate and we do know the fixed exchange rate you, you want to have your money paid to something measure and value such as gold and with the floating exchange rate, the cur currency is pretty much floating in currency in contrast to a fixed currency the value which is instead specified in terms of material goods another currency or a set of currencies, which is how we get the whole foreign exchange forex. Um, so, so that's where we are now. So, I asked the question before I asked why Bitcoin. Why did we change the system? Why did, did Nixon shock the system? Why is it called the Nixon shock? Because shock is a heck of a word to use. So, that's pretty much probably what it did. It shocked our financial system. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm a financial expert. But I've, I've sat with financial experts who didn't know these things. So at this point, what is a financial expert? All right, moving right along, not to get off topic. <laughs> so we talked about bread and wools. Now I want to bring you to an article I found. And this is directly from the International Monetary Fund, the IM. We're, we're going to read a little bit. And this, this Christina is... The IMF Managing Director of Washington, D.C. So these are her words. So we're just going to read briefly. First, I want to thank Dr. Ernest Addison for his excellent remarks and contributions as chairman of the IMF Board of Governors. Re reflecting on a dr dramatic change in the world over the last year, I paid a visit to the Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where 44 men signed our Articles of Agreement in 1944. Our founders faced two massive tasks to deal with intermediate devastation caused by the war and to lay the foundation for a more peaceful and prosperous post-war world. Got, got to mention that the Bretton Woods was pretty much done during the war, World War II, I believe. 
and you had something unprecedented happening in the world where they had to fix the monetary system or secure it. All right. So at the conclusion of the conference, John Maynard Keynes captured the significance of international cooperation as hope for the world. If we can continue, the brotherhood of man will have become more than a phrase. He said. As we look forward to welcoming and as our 190th member, the work of the IMF is testament to the values of cooperation and solidarity on which a sisterhood and brotherhood of humanity is built. Today, we face a new Bretton Woods moment, a pandemic that has already caused more than a million lives and economic comity that will make the economy 4.4% smaller this year and strip an estimated $11 trillion of output by next year. An untold human desperation in the face of huge disruption and rising poverty for the first time in decades. Once again, we face two massive tasks to fight the crisis today and to build a better tomorrow. So, so not to keep reading that because it's, it's a little depressing, but what I wanted to highlight, this, this is, to me, this is big. Uh, today, we face a new Breading Woods moment. This is coming from the managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Today, we face a new Breading Woods moment. Bretton Woods moment in 1990 in 1940 pretty much changed the monetary due to the, the world war we were in. now a new Bretton Woods moment due to the pandemic that and, and the two massive tasks is to fight the crisis today and to build a better tomorrow so it seems like, like the IMF said we're in a new Bretton Woods moment which which can change the monetary system of the world why Bitcoin? So, with all that said, I believe this is why Bitcoin. The difference is Bitcoin has no headquarters. Bitcoin is ran by computers. If Bitcoin was created anonymously, ironically, in 2008, when we had our air quote crash, Bitcoin has a max supply. We won't have to worry about inflation. The overprinting of Bitcoin. And with that said, let's go to inflation and see what that means. Inflation is a decline of purchasing power of a given currency over time. We want to stop there. A decline of purchasing power of a given currency over time. So if someone gives us money, like the stimulus checks, according to uh, the IMF, the dollar has lost 10%. So that same 600 bucks was not the same 600 bucks as last year. Why do I say that? Well, it's called inflation. So, inflation calculator. We're going to try this here. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to, let's go back to, we're going to go to 1913. You know, it's not quite the time that Thomas Jefferson was talking. It's, it's way out, but still, we're going to talk about why he made those statements. So, in 1913, if I had $5 in, in 1913, how, how much would I need to have that same purchasing power today? Calculate. So, in 1913, $5 would be enough to purchase $131 worth of goods today. That is essentially inflation, folks, where the purchasing power of your money is dwindling. And, and uh, yeah, that's where we at. So when you hear those big athletes uh, and you say, oh, this guy got $225 million contract, and then you go. And you, and you go to a guy who was in 1980, and you say, okay, those, those guys played in 1980, and they weren't making the same amount of money as those other guys. Well, maybe they were, because a million dollars in 1980 was, was two million now. You see that? That is insane. So, essentially, those guys may be having a higher number with these new contracts, but... The purchasing power is not the same. All right, so re quick recap: Bitcoin twenty-seven. Let's refresh the screen, and probably didn't went up or went down. You know, Bitcoin. Yeah, twenty-seven thousand sixty-seven bucks for one. And if you want to go, uh, my goodness, does that say six hundred and sixteen dollars? And 
So four years ago, this is the fastest, largest growing asset in the history of humanity. One. So your purchasing power is expanding exponentially with Bitcoin, more so than anything else. So aside from that being Tom, Thomas Jefferson told us, warned us, they put the executive order in place. They had us on a fixed currency. They did the Bretton Woods and World War to stop the world from collapsing. And then Nixon came with the shock. And we went to a floating currency. And by the way, after the Nixon shock, you, it was okay for you to uh, hoard gold again. So pretty much they let you know you got to be your own reserve now. Because prior to then, executive order in 1933, it was illegal to hoard gold. But after the Nixon shock in 71, you can hoard gold again. So that's essentially the United States government telling us you need to be your own reserve. That's what I got. And then, and then we have the Bretton Woods moment in 1944. And then we have the IMF telling us in 2020 that today we face a new Bretton Woods moment. And then we have the inflation, losing your purchasing power. You can play with this inflation cocky. And, and then I want to give a special shout out to, to a guy that got me into crypto. The late, great Nipsey Nipsey Hussle, man. You know, I'm a hip hop guy. I love, I love hip hop. And I really don't listen to a lot of new artists. I consider Nip a new artist. I went to two of his shows and uh, I heard the brother talk about cryptocurrency. And like I say, I'm not a financial guy, but for some reason, when I start studying crypto, I said, this is, this makes sense. This really makes sense. So, shout out to Nip, long live Nip. And it's just an honor to have a guy from hip hop who can broaden your horizons on multiple things. And it's a lot of guys that did that too. But Nip, man, just just shout out to Nip. Long live Nip, man. The great hustler of all time. Peace.